friends, good morning and welcome. Friends, good morning and welcome. I'd like to firstly acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Wurundjeri people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present, and any elders who may be with us today. I would also like to warmly welcome Rabbi Shmuley Boteach and Sharen Haskell, a government member of the Knesset, and thank you both for joining us as we celebrate the 68th anniversary of the State of Israel. My name is Anthony Raitman, and I am the president of the Caulfield Hebrew Congregation, now to be known as Caulfield Shul. Very shortly, we will sing the Australian National Anthem and make the Hamoitzi. I'm extremely proud to be standing here in front of over 500 people celebrating Yom Ha'atzmaut at our annual Yom Ha'atzmaut breakfast. And I'd like to acknowledge and recognise the host of dignitaries who have graciously accepted our invitation to attend today including firstly our Rabbonim, Rabbi Ganendi, Rabbi Helbrun and Rabbi Krasnansky, Mark Dreyfus QC, Federal Shadow Attorney General and Shadow Minister for the Arts, Michael Danby, Federal Member for Melbourne Ports, Philip Daladakis, State Minister for Small Business, Innovation and Trade, representing the Minister for Multicultural Affairs and Citizenship, Tim Smith, the State Shadow Parliamentary Secretary to the Leader, Population Policy and Housing Affordability, David Southwick, the member for Caulfield, Mrs Jennifer Huppert, President, Jewish Community Council of Victoria, Danny Lamb, the newly elected president of Mizrahi Organisation and the Zionist Federation of, Victoria, of, of Australia, Glen Ira Council Mayor Neil Killing and Councillors Mary Del Hunty, Michael Lipschutz and Jamie Hyams, and Mr Mick Brott, Life Governor of Caulfield Hebrew Congregation. Of course, I'd like to welcome everybody else here today as very strong and close friends of Caulfield Shul. Caulfield Shul continues to raise the bar as one of the most vibrant and active shuls across Australia. We continue to build our profile, our reputation and the range of programs on offer to our members and the wider community. We've also recently released our new branding, which most of you will see for the first time later this morning. This breakfast would not be possible without the generous and ongoing support of our major sponsor, Mr. Ron Tataka, founder and managing director of Scott Winton Insurance Brokers, and we thank Ron for his ongoing continued support. <laughs> Caulfield Shul also acknowledges the Dina and Ron Goldschlager Family Charitable Foundation for their continued support, not only of this important event for Israel, but of Caulfield Shul. And we welcome Link Financial Services back as a sponsor this year, together with our new sponsors, MicroCloud and the Tallow Group. I would also just like to acknowledge the best bunch who did our table decorations today for the wonderful work that they do uh, in the community to provide employment for people with disabilities. But I now invite Rabbi Helbrun to lead us in singing Advanced Australia Fair to be followed by Hamoitzi by Adam Siegel. Thanks, Rabbi. Australians, all oh, let us rejoice, for we are young and free.
Thank you, everyone. We have a, a packed agenda today, but let me uh, invite you to enjoy your meal, and we'll be back with you shortly. He has built around him over that time. Rabbi Ganendi continues to inspire the board and our community to expand our thinking, broaden our knowledge, and deepen our commitment to modern Orthodox Judaism. Please join me in welcoming Rabbi Ganendi to address us. Boketov, Chag Sameach, and welcome everybody. If you had to sum it all up in one word, one phrase, what would it be? If you had to encapsulate your dreams and your aspirations in just one slogan, what would it be? What would you choose? If I had to condense the significance of our community, of your Yomazmut, of Israel, of this morning for our community, I would choose just one word, connect. Only connect, because connection is what makes us human. Ever since that very first human being, Adam, Adam Arishon, Adam reached out across the chasm of his solitude, and he reached out across to Eve and discovered her, ever since he articulated those very first words ever spoken and discovered the poetry of his being as well as poetry itself, it's always been about connection. It's the essence of the relationship between man and woman. It's the basis of relationship between parents and children. It's the anchor of community. It's what links us together as a global family. It's at the very core of what Judaism has recognized from its inception that Lord Tov Hayot Adam Levado. It's not good. Aloneness is not good for the human condition. Loneliness erodes the human heart. Or as the Yiddish expression puts it, a stein soll sein allein, aber a mensch darf noch a mensch. A stone can stay alone, but a person needs another person. People not only need people, but as they say in Africa, people become people through people. And connecting people to people, <laughs> linking hearts to hearts, joining hands to hands, that's what we do so well at Corfield Shul. We strive to be a community of inclusion, to reach out to all Jews, regardless of their gender or their agenda, their age or their stage of life, their proclivities or their idiosyncrasies. We strive to embrace the other, to create a space in our shul for the stranger and for the seeker, regardless of their faith or their faithlessness. We do it through our many programs and our activities from Caulfield Bubs to our seniors' Schmooze Day program from Shafar in the park to visit from Muslim youth groups. We do it through spectacular one-off events like yesterday's sensational Israel service that many of you participated in, and we do it through events like this with our rivet riveting guest scholar, and Shmuli has been our scholar in residence, Rabbi Shmuli Botar, together here with, with Debbie over the weekend. And we do it by celebrating our inextricable connectedness to the State of Israel, to Medinat Yisrael, by this breakfast, by our pride and our passion for Israel, by standing up for Israel when others seek to demonize it or when others seek to diminish it. And we do it too by reaching out to the next generation, to cultivating our young leaders for tomorrow, through our Inca 572 committee, through our Hineni youth group, and they're rep represented here today. They're right there, I can see their tables, two large tables, and we are grateful for their attendance, and we're thrilled by the way they've embraced our development plans. And as I said before, they say, you know, that hospitality is making your guests feel at home, even if they wish they were. And I suspect that many of our young people, as they would rather be at bed on, at home on a Sunday morning, but we are so pleased to have them here as we are delighted to have all of you here today. Only connect. And some four years ago, we also made a decision at Caulfield Shul to connect all the pieces that make us who we are, to formulate them into an ethos, into a mission statement, and then to bring them all together into a new building. And that's what the redevelopment building strategy, which was recently unanimously approved by the Glenara City Council, and we acknowledge those good councillors as Anthony has already this morning and thank them. And we are currently addressing the next steps, which include further design and building quotes and the refining of our fundraising strategy. 
The chair of our redevelopment committee, Rodney Horan, is happily and not so coincidentally in Israel, and he's been texting and sending photos saying this is what Israel, this is what your Ma'at Smort is like in Israel. He's there as part of the March of the Living program. But he's also with us here today to introduce our redevelopment video. So I want to thank you all for being here this morning, for supporting our journey, for supporting our vision. In those memorable words of the sage John Lennon, a dream you dream alone is only a dream, but a dream that you dream together, that's a reality. If you dream it and you do it together, it's no dream alone. <coughs> As you don't know me, I'm Robert Wheel, I'm the, uh, the Vice President, Past President, Immediate Past President, I'm not sure, titles are not a big thing in my vocabulary. Let's suffice it to say that I'm a, a very happy and proud member of Corfu Shul, and I'm very proud to look out on such a wonderful large audience who have come to pay tribute to Corfu Shul and to pay tribute to Eric to Medina Israel on this, the occasion of the 68th anniversary of Israel's independence. Our, um, our guest speaker, Rabbi Shmuley Bataiah, for those of you who were in shul over Shabbat, will certainly not, not, not need any introduction, because I know for a fact that his words, his oratory, um, have caused us all to still remain spellbound, even up to this morning, for his oratory and his uh, message has penetrated our hearts, our minds and our souls. For those of you who uh, have not heard Rabbi Bataya speak or not familiar with him, let me just give you a few uh, details from his bio. Shmuel Bataya is America's rabbi. He's one of Israel's most eloquent and respected defenders in the world. The international best-selling author of 30 books and winner of the London Times Preacher of the Year competition, Rabbi Shmuley's award-winning columns and TV and radio broadcasts have attracted a global audience. Labelled as the most famous rabbi in America by Newsweek and the Washington Post and one of the 50 most influential Jews in the world by the Jerusalem Post. Rabbi Shmuley served for 11 years as rabbi at the University of Oxford and is founder of World Values Network, one of the premier organizations protecting Israel in the international media. I could also add to that, on a personal note, that uh, Shmuley and Debbie have been wonderful, loyal and valued friends of my family, of myself and my family, over many years, and we really do value that friendship very much. And the reason why we have invited him back can be summed up, and I was contemplating how am I going to introduce him. Unfortunately, thanks to uh, Shmuley, a copy of his brand new book, which has just hit the market, and I was reading it over Shabbat, it's called The Israel Warrior, and it will be available for sale tonight at Kofu Shul after another event that we're having with him. Um, but the very first paragraph I read provided me with uh, the ideal introduction to him. Let me read it to you. He writes, I have written this book because I love Israel. I love its Jewishness. I love its freedom. I love its democracy. I love its values. I love its universalism. And I love its focus and support for human rights. I want to share that love but more, I want to share why I feel this way. I know we all feel like that, that's why we're all here today. Israel is foremost in our hearts and our minds, and the message which I know the Shmuel is going to impart without preempting his speech, will be that it is important for us to have this message, not just in our hearts, but to challenge us to take action, to stand up, for Israel in a very difficult time in Israel's history. So it gives me great pleasure to please uh, welcome our guest speaker, Rabbi Shmuley Botaya.
I can't say that I'm not disappointed to discover that Caulfield Synagogue discriminates against short people. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Robert, thank you very much for your warm words. I would not be here were it not for you and for our friendship, largely because you're the only one who wanted me here. <laughs> and I'm grateful for all the efforts that you made. Uh, to Anthony, the president of the shul, especially to Rabbi Ganendi, the audacious spiritual leader of the shul, their wives, the board members, the shul members who invited me and my wife and our two children into your hearts this past weekend. I could not be more grateful, even though our 10-year-old son spent most of Shabbos in a sleep-induced coma, um, largely created by the speeches that I was giving over Shabbos, but partially attributed as well to jet lag. A woman arrives into Israel, an American tourist, and she alights at Ben-Gurion Airport and she hails a cab, and little does she realize what she's about to experience as the Israeli cab driver accelerates first to 100 kilometers an hour, 200 kilometers an hour, and then there's a red light, and as he approaches the red light, he accelerates to 300 kilometers an hour, and she's holding on for dear life as they go through the red light. She barely catches her breath. She can't believe she's still alive. He slows down, but then there's a red light again. He begins to accelerate, 100 kilometers an hour, 200, 300, goes through the red light. She knows she's going to die. Miracle of miracles, she's still alive. And then suddenly, as she begins to see a green light, salvation at last, the cab driver screeches to a complete halt and stops on a dime just before the green light. And she looks at him and she says to him, you are a crazy man. It's bad enough that you nearly killed me by these accelerated speeds. But going through the red lights when we could have died. But why did you stop when the light was green? And the Israeli cab driver looks at her and says to her, Are you crazy? The other Israeli cab driver had a red light. <laughs> the only people who laughed are those people who've been in the back of an Israeli cab driver. My friends, do you still remember the days when the most dangerous thing you could do in Israel was hold on to dear life as an Egged bus driver would weave through ancient medieval alleys and you would wonder how he could possibly do it and he'd say, don't worry, I used to drive a tank on the Golan Heights. <laughs> do you remember when the greatest threats facing the Jewish state was the occasional op-ed where some arch critic, fueled by uh, irrational dislike of the Jewish people, could find some fault with the Middle East's only democracy. My God, my God, how distant those days now feel. As we awaken to a reality where Israel faces a global assault against its very existence, demonized in virtually every form, character assassinated in media organs throughout the world. And that is not even the worst of it. Israeli citizens being stabbed and shot and having tractor trailers mow them down on the streets of Jerusalem and the streets of Tel Aviv and the streets of Ranana. My God, what have we come to? that the most moral nation on earth, given the existential threat that it faces, has simultaneously become the most hated and the most reviled. You know, I remember as a small boy, 
six years old, one month shy of my seventh birthday, when I woke up early on a Yom Kippur morning to accompany my father to our local shul. And since I was just a boy, my father promised me that I could break my fast early that morning. And as we arrived at shul at 9 a.m., I reminded him that I wanted to eat some crackers, and my father looked at me very solemnly, and he said to me, a war has broken out in Israel today, and many thousands of soldiers have already died. You should fast a few hours longer so that God will have compassion on his people. So I fasted until 12 o'clock and then 1 o'clock. And I came back to my father and my father said to me, the war has gotten much worse. All of Israel's defenses have been penetrated. Israel is fighting for its very existence. You should fast just a little bit longer so that God will have compassion on his people. And I fasted until nearly 3 o'clock. And then as a small child, my friends, I happened to have had some pasty crackers left over from some bar mitzvah a month earlier that had turned into an, 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 an inedible, moldy morass, and I quickly shoved it into my mouth, and I broke my fast, and I never forgot that day that I had a responsibility, even as a six-year-old child, to be concerned and to be worried about Israel's future that no one is absolved for the security of the Jewish state. And when I was with my son 10 days ago on the Golan Heights where those great battles were fought, as we prepared to say goodbye to him so he can return to his unit, on his base facing the, the Lebanese border and the monsters of Hezbollah fueled by Iran, paid for by an Iran nuclear agreement that has just given the Ayatollahs and the Mullahs $150 billion. And to give you an understanding of what that means, Israel gets $3 billion a year in American military assistance. It would take them 50 years to get that kind of money. And it has given Hezbollah advanced infrared imaging equipment, which allows them to penetrate deeply into Israel, risking every IDF soldier on the border. And as I said goodbye to my son, and as he had tears streaming down his cheeks, he's all of 23 years old. Last year he was an undergraduate at New York University. He's now a combat soldier trying to protect Israel from a group that has seven, 800,000 rockets that they can pour into the north of Israel. As he had to say goodbye to his mother who is here today and his small siblings who he's not watching growing up, his two nieces who he misses, as he was going back to living Beshetach in the field, being able to speak to his parents just 10 minutes a week as they take away even his telephone. I put my arms on him and I said to him, Mendy, 40 years ago, my only option was not to eat crackers. But you are an Israel warrior. And you will defend your people. And if it means being separated from your family, you'll do that. And if it means sometimes, God forbid, putting yourself in the line of fire, then you'll do that. But this people, my friends, this people will live. We are tired of dying. We have stolen no man's land. We have killed no man's God. We are tired of an enmity we have never earned, of a hatred we do not deserve of a character assassination that is utterly unbecoming on the nations who visited upon us. We, my friends, have been the light. It is we who have given the world the notion of the one God and therefore the infinite value of every human life. It is we who have given the world the Ten Commandments and therefore the dignity of the law and the protection of individual rights. Do you think it is an accident that Israel is the only country in the world where women are treated not as chattel or cattle, but as equal human beings? Do you believe it? it's a coincidence that as we, my organization, the World Values Network, hosted Amir Ochana, the head of the LGBT caucus in the Knesset, and the first openly gay Likud member just a week ago being honored alongside the Crown Prince of Iran, Reza Pahlavi, Sheldon and Miriam Adelson, the world's foremost Jewish philanthropist, Pamela Anderson, <laughs> great friend of Israel, Great photo ops, too. <laughs> Do you think it's an accident that Israel has one of the largest gay pride parades regardless of your religious disposition to homosexuality? 
while in Iran, those same men are taken with a noose around their heads in a city square, and they are lifted with construction cranes until the oxygen supply is cut off from their necks for the crime of being socially undesirable. And as their feet swing to and fro from their lifeless corpses, every little movement indicts a hypocritical West, which couldn't give a damn that they are being slaughtered and murdered and killed, while in Israel every human being lives with equal majesty and equal dignity. My friends, Israel is not the Jewish homeland. It is that, of course. Israel is the great Arab hope. Would only our Arab brothers and sisters be able to condemn their prime ministers the way Israelis can condemn Bibi Netanyahu, where the sole consequence is you might get a sunburn standing out too, too long in the light. What are what the Arab brothers and sisters could choose to marry how they wish based on love and romance rather than the law in Gaza, the genocidal government of Gaza that punishes an honor killing if a brother or an uncle comes to kill a young Palestinian woman for the crime of falling in love where the official punishment is two whole years of incarceration, which is never even enforced. Would it that my Arab brothers and sisters created equally in the image of God as every Jewish child, would it that they would have Israel's freedoms? If Israel succeeds, our Arab brothers and sisters will succeed. But if this great experiment of human rights, democracy, and representative government in the Middle East fails, then God help every Arab man, woman, and child who will continue to be condescended to by the West, and they will be told that you're not ready for freedom. You're not ready for democracy. You're not ready to treat women like human beings. The infantilization of our Arab brothers and sisters is an absolute disgrace. My friends, Every Jew on earth owes a debt of gratitude to Islam. It was Muslims who took us in when we were expelled from Catholic Spain in 1492. It was Muslims in the Ottoman Empire and the Sultans who took us into Constantinople, Istanbul, in 1503, when King Manuel III made a deal with Ferdinand and Isabella that the only way that he could marry their daughter was by expelling his Jews. Islam has gone through great periods of enlightenment. And let's never forget that when the Crusaders conquered Jerusalem in 1087, the first thing they did was slaughter every Jewish man, woman, and child. But when the greatest Islamic conqueror of all, Sultan Salah al-Din, reconquered Jerusalem in 1187, he proclaimed that all Jews should return in peace and dignity. And his greatest physician and closest advisor, one of the greatest rabbis that ever lived, Moses Maimonides. Let us remind our Muslim brothers and sisters of the majesty of their religious tradition. Let us remind them that they were the first to institute laws protecting prisoners of war, that ISIS cutting off people's heads is an abomination not to decency, not to morality, not to ethics. It is an abomination to Islam. That Islamic fueled anti-Semitism, calling for the death of Jews, glorification of Shahids, which I see every time I visit the communities in Yudan Shamron. That Islam has never glorified murderers. That Islam lives by the same Ten Commandments, that thou shalt not murder. This is not a conflict over land, my friends. This is a conflict over values on the very last day of his life. Moses gathers around the Jews knowing he has but a few hours left with, him, with them to lead them. And he looks the hundreds of thousands in the eyes and he says to them, remember now and forever 
that every day of your life you will be confronted with a single choice. You will be confronted with a choice to either embrace life or to embrace death. Uvacharta bachayim. And you must choose life. There is a new generation of Jews who have rejected the martyrdom of the past and who now wish to fight for Jewish life, to give it value, to give it meaning, and to serve as a great light to all the nations of the Middle East. A few days ago, before I left Israel, I went to Yad Vashem. And in one of the displays, I saw something that rattled me to my core. It had a list of the concentration camps, how many died at each, and how many, how many SS guards were there guarding the Jewish inmates. Sobibor, 235,000 murdered. SS guards, 20. Treblinka, 750,000 murdered. SS guards, 15. Belzec murdered 350,000 SS guards, 25. How could this have happened, my friends? How could 25 SS guards have murdered hundreds of thousands of Jews? And for the longest time, there was this narrative that basically said, the Jews marched like sheep to the slaughter. The Jews walked into gas chambers, but we dare never denigrate the memory of the six million by portraying them as sheep to the slaughter. No, my friends, these were the bravest, most courageous of all martyrs. And they exercised the only option known to them, which was not to live. The Jews were not given that option for 2,000 years. They had no state, they had no army. Their only option was to die proudly as Jews. On Friday night at Caulfield, I told the story of Mordechai Anilevich, the father of modern Jewish resistance, who on the 19th of April, 1943, gathered together his 700 warriors of the Warsaw Ghetto, and he gave them the few Molotov cocktails they could distribute, and the few broken pistols they had, and the few bullets by which to fire at the SS. Thousands of troops that were amassing against them with artillery. And he looked them in the eye, and he had but three weeks to live, and he said to them, today we choose between death and death. We have no ability to overcome the SS. We will never beat them. We will die here in this bunker in Mila 18. The choice given to you, rather, is how you will die. You will either die as free men who had fought back, who had the courage to resist this monstrous oppression, or we will die like rats in the sewer, let us die like men. And going all the way back to Masada, that was the only choice given to the Jews. To take your own life rather than become a vassal and a slave of Rome. It was summed up so hauntingly by Elie Wiesel in Night. I've had the pleasure and privilege of having Elie Wiesel as a friend for 25 years. And he was honored at our dinner on Yom HaShoah on May 5th, 10 days ago. You all know the quote. Never shall I forget that night, the first night in camp, which has turned my life into one long night, seven times cursed and seven times sealed. Never shall I forget those moments which murdered my God and my soul and turned my dreams into dust. Never shall I forget these things even if I am condemned to live as long as God himself. Never. And in an even more haunting passage, when a little boy of just eight was arrested by the SS in Birkenau for smuggling turnips to his dying father, and he was put on the gallows, but he didn't die instantly because he was too light. So he sat there choking. So the SS made the Jewish inmates walk past his dying child. 
And Wiesel says, then came the march past the victim. The older men put to death with the boy were no longer alive. Their tongues were hanging out swollen and bluish. But the third rope, the little boy, it was still moving. The child was too light. He was still breathing. And so he remained for more than half an hour lingering between life and death, writhing before our eyes. And we were forced to look at him at close range. He was still alive. When I personally passed him, his tongue was still red. His eyes had not yet been distinguished. And behind me, when I heard a man ask the question, for God's sake, where is God? Another man behind me said, there he is, there is God. God is hanging on that tree. For thousands of years, that was Jewish theology, that we were somehow punished for a sin that we had never committed. That Jews were gassed at Auschwitz because they had broken the Sabbath, or they, be, they ceased to want to be Jewish. They had changed their names. They had wanted to be more German than the Germans themselves. So God visited hell upon us so that we would know that we are a people who could never abandon our covenant. My friends, does that live up to the name Yisrael, he who wrestles with God? What was the reaction of Abraham when, he, when God told him that the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah were going to be destroyed? Abraham lifts his hands to the heavens and like a cudgel berating the celestial ends, he says, Shall the judge of the entire earth not practice justice? When 1.5 million Jewish children are gassed to death with chemical gas invading their lungs, will the judge of the entire earth not practice justice? When six million innocent Jews, guilty of no crime, the most faithful nation in the history of the world who held on to their tradition, their identity, through every massacre, through the crusades, through the expulsions, through the pogroms, through the inquisitions, held on to their God, held on to their Shabbos, held on to their tzitzis, held on to their mezuzahs, held on to their Pesach, held on to their sukkah. When they are marched into the ravines of Babiar, where is the voice of Moses? to look God in the eye and say to him, if you continue to pummel this people, I wish for my own name to be expunged from the Torah that you have written because I can no longer be part of a religion of death. I cannot die anymore. I shall not die for I shall live. And that is the statement of the modern Jewish state of Israel. We will live. You will try to defame us on our campuses, but we will respond and we will live. You will try to invade our borders from Gaza and pummel our cities with rockets, but we will find both God's blessing and technology and we will live. You will send Fedayeen, you will send Shaheeds, you will send suicide bombers to try to blow us into little bits. But we will build anew, and we will live. I shall never die. Martyrdom must be consigned to the Jewish past. Let us live, my friends, with the olive green uniforms of the IDF. Let us live with a new spirit of spiritual defiance. Rabbis who stop giving disgusting, vile explanations for Jewish tragedy and instead demand from God that the Jewish people be accorded the most basic right, that is the right of every human being, to die at peace in a bed somewhere rather than your limbs being collected from a telephone pole. I am not here to die. I am guilty of no crime. And I have grown tired of the vile, disgusting defamation 
of that great miracle of a nation. That beacon of Jewish light. That bastion of human rights. That materialization of Jewish hopes and dreams. The one and only Jewish state of Israel. The fulfillment of our hopes, the realization of our ambitions. My God, my God, how beautiful it is. From the greenery of the Golan to the brown green sands of the Negev, from the warm waters of the Mediterranean to the clear blue, blue crystal waters of the Kinneret. My God, my God, how beautiful it is. And how it calls to us and beckons to us to be warriors for Israel. Did you all think that it was going to end with people like my son or your sons who are Chayalim Bodadim, lone soldiers? Did you think that no one was ever going to call upon us to fight? Do you think that this PR battle for Israel's good name is something that the Israeli government is supposed to be waging? That's just going to be seen as cheap propaganda. This is our battle. This is our war. We must awaken ourselves from our complacency. They will not take Israel from us. They will try. And my God, they are trying harder than ever. But we will dig our fingernails into it and we will hold on to Israel for dear life. This country shall never fall again. Israel, my friends, is forever. The only question is whether you and I will have the great privilege of being part of that dream. You know, a few years back, an Oxford student, and by the way, I want you to know, talking about a culture of life. I never expected, the, the Yom Kippur War had this indelible impression on me, which is why I started with that story. I'll never forget being six years old and hearing that Israel might not be. And Israel came very close to being annihilated in the Yom Kippur War. And it's one of the reasons that I will forever revere the memory of Richard Nixon, anti-Semite though he was, because he initiated, initiated the airlift that saved Israel from destruction even with his Jewish Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, trying to delay it, hoping Israel would have a bloodied nose so that it would be more open to peace negotiations. But I never thought that I would have the privilege, years later, to take my son in his uniform, holding his Tabor rifle, and showing him the Golan Heights through the eyes of Vigdor Kahalani, Israel's greatest living war hero. And as Kalani gave us this tour of the Ema Kabacha, the Vale of Tears, where the second largest tank battle in human history took place between the days of the 6th of October and the 9th of October, over three days, 2,000 tanks clashed. The only larger tank battle in history was the Battle of Kursk during the Second World War, where the Russians overwhelmed the Germans and largely turned the tide of battle. It was 10 a.m., Kalani was in his 20s. He had just come back from his brother's Sheva Brachot, and his commander, the legendary Yanosh Ben Gal, called on the walkie-talkie and he said to him, Avigdor, there will be a war today at 6 p.m. It is guaranteed, it has been confirmed by military intelligence and by the Mossad. They were off by a few hours. The war was launched exactly at 1.55 p.m. Kalani had 13 tanks under his command. He was about to face 600. And he called his soldiers together and he said to them, Soldiers, you must know that in a few hours' time you will have the fight of your life. We will be completely overwhelmed. We will face odds that no tank commanders in modern history have faced. But we are not going to choose how to die. We are going to win. We are going to fight them and beat them and hold them back. And you know why we're going to beat them? Because there's nothing behind you except men, women, and children who will be slaughtered if they penetrate your line of defense. You are the front line. You will hold the line. 
you will never retreat. We stand right here, and he showed us the line that he drew, we will never retreat. And 90% of the men that he spoke to were dead within 24 hours, but they held that line. And the Syrians ultimately had to give up on the 9th of October, and they began to retreat. And as he finished his speech to his soldiers, Kahalani picked up an apple. And he's not the most religious or observant Jew. He's a Taimani Jew. But everybody fasts in Israel on Yom Kippur. And he said, my first order to you as soldiers of my battalion is, you will eat. And then he took a bite of the apple. And he said, Judaism says you have to eat. We are not a religion of death. No more martyrdom, no more starvation, no more pain. We will fight and we will not die and Israel will live. So when a student from Oxford came to see me, when I was the rabbi there a few years back, and he called me on a, Friday, on a Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. and he said, I have to see you urgently, I have to see you right now. I told him, it's 5 o'clock Sunday, I'm going home. He said, but it's an emergency. He runs from Malden College, Oxford. Oxford is comprised of 35 different colleges. He reaches my office in the city center in Carfax. I say to him, what's the emergency? He said, I am fuming, I am furious. I said, what did I do? He said, the doctor of divinity at our school, which is Oxford's fancy name for a chaplain, told me last night that because my mother is Jewish, even though my father is not, and I've been raised C of E, Church of England, I wasn't bar mitzvah, I wasn't circumcised, but because my mother is Jewish, I'm a Jew. I said, okay. He said, I don't want to be a Jew. I said to him, speak to your mother, I had nothing to do with this. <laughs> he said, I'm not leaving until you make me not Jewish. I said, we're going to be here a long time, <laughs> because according to us Jews, you can have all the holy water in the world poured on you, and he said, Sved Goran is elephant. He said to me, that's not true. He said, I came prepared. I researched on the internet and I discovered that you can excommunicate me. I said to him, excommunicate you? I said, there hasn't been a Jewish excommunication since the great philosopher, Baruch de Spinoza, Benedict de Spinoza, the Dutch philosopher, who was excommunicated for biblical criticism, trying to prove the Torah wasn't written by God. And that was back in 1653, and scholars still debate till today whether he should have been excommunicated. Even David Ben-Gurion tried to reverse it. He said, I am camped out in your office. I am not leaving. I said, you sure are stubborn like a Jew. Okay, that's <laughs> one character trait you have. My friends, it was 5.30 now. I was hungry, I was tired. My wife and my kids were waiting to have dinner. So I looked at him and I said to him, listen, we rabbis do circumcisions for 100 pounds. We do bar mitzvahs for 200 pounds. We do weddings for 300 pounds and excommunications for 400 pounds. He said, why so steep? I said, it costs more to get out than it does to get in. <laughs> he said, um, do you perchance have a student discount? And I said to him, nah, we do that. The floodgates will open tomorrow. There'll be a line going around the corner. Every Jewish student is going to want to be excommunicated. I said, you know, I can maybe throw in a free circumcision for your firstborn son. I could, we do a package deal. And then my friends, I took out my piece, I took out my laptop and I typed out a certificate. I wrote, I Rabbi Shmuley Batea, hereby excommunicate you and all your progeny from the Jewish people henceforth and evermore. And then I added in good old Oxonian Latin, uh, Kush, and Tachas. Um, <laughs> he asked me what that meant. I said, it's a certificate of authenticity. It's, um, And then I gave him this completely worthless piece of paper. And he took it from me and he started to walk from my office. And I said to him, uh-uh, uh-uh, not so fast. 
you know you owe me. He said, yes, I know I owe you, and I know exactly what you're gonna ask. I said, of course you know what I'm gonna ask. It's the most obvious question. You come to my office on a Sunday afternoon, you throw a fit that you discovered you're a Jew, it bothers you to the high heaven. You demand to be excommunicated. I at least deserve to know why. Why did this bother you so much? Why did it bother you so much to discover that you're a Jew? And he looked at me and he said to me, you know, we've never met before. But you're a foolish, stupid man. I said, okay, <laughs> why am I so foolish? He said, because that is a ridiculous question whose answer is self-evident. Why do I not want to be a Jew? He said, I'm a historian. I study history here at Oxford. And I have studied about how the Romans ruled and the Greeks philosophized, and the Aztecs built, and the Jews died, and died, and died. And you are silly enough to ask me why I don't want to be conscripted into a nation which is the single most hated on earth. And my friends, I knew I would never see this student again. I just had a premonition, and I never did. I would meet his mother two years later at a literary party because she was an agent, and she came over to me and told me you, you had met my son, but I, had, I never saw that student again, and I have no idea where he is today. And this was my only opportunity to leave any lasting Jewish impression on him. So I looked back at him and I said to him, you're right. You're a historian, and you have indeed read how the Romans ruled, how the Greeks philosophized, how the Aztecs built, and how the Jews died. But when it came to meeting a Jew, you didn't read about it, and you didn't study about it, and you didn't watch a documentary about it, you picked up the damn phone because I'm still here and they're not. And all you can ever do is read about them and talk about them. But when you want to meet a real live Jew, you picked up the damn phone because I'm Yisroel Chai. We as a nation still live against every form of adversity against every challenge to our existence. We still live. We are a nation of life. And that's why Israel will trade a thousand killers and monsters and terrorists for one life. For one life. For one life. And that's why if an Australian soldier dies in Afghanistan, which is a tragedy, and we lose three American soldiers almost every day, and it doesn't even make headlines. And in Israel, if a single boy or a woman loses their life wearing the uniform, the entire country is in mourning. So come, my friends. Be an Israel warrior. Fight for the Jewish state. When I first wrote this book, The Israel Warrior, and I thank Robert for that great plug, I actually received a phone call from the world's foremost Jewish philanthropist, Sheldon Adelson, who's very involved in my work with the number one organization advertising for Israel in American media and global media. And he said to me, you need to put together a book that has all the arguments for Israel so that people have it at their fingertips. We subtitled it, Fighting Back for the Jewish State from Campus to Street Corner. But in a larger sense, it wasn't about the information contained therein. It was about creating a new mindset. It is no longer, I think, therefore I am. My friends, we Jews, I fight, therefore I am. Do not die for a cause, God forbid. Do not live for a cause 
you must learn to fight for a cause. Join me in being the Israel warrior. And with that, I conclude with the famous story of Yisrael Rakover that, was, that so deeply influenced me and my children. A, sto a statement of Jewish faith. The writer, the Israeli writer Tzvi Kulitz, tells of a, a ger chassid, long pears, white socks, 11 children, reduced to the ash heap of the Warsaw Ghetto in its last few hours. And General Jorgen Stroop, the SS commander, was now bringing up the heavy howitzers to reduce the entire ghetto to ashes. He would later blow up the Warsaw Great Synagogue and cable Himmler, the ghetto is no more. And two hours before he did so, Kulitz tells us, Yisrael Rakover had his last child lift his eyes above the parapet to see where the German artillery was being brought in. And the German sniper shot him between the eyes, and now the boy fell back dead into his father's lap. And now Yisrael Rakover had lost absolutely everything. And in his last moments of life, he took out a pen and a paper, and he wrote a letter to God that is known today as the last will and testament of Yisrael Rakover. And he wrote, Lord God Almighty, you have robbed me of all that I hold dear. You robbed me of love by allowing the murder of my wife. You robbed me of my future through the murder of all my 11 children. You robbed me of my humanity as I sit here incarcerated like a dog in this dilapidated ruin surrounded by murderers who will soon snuff out my life. But there is one thing you will never rob me of, and there is one thing you will never take from me, for I am greater than you. You have done everything in your power to make me believe that you do not exist. You have done everything to prove that God is nothing but a myth, that there is no justice to the universe. You have done everything to strip me of the last thing left to me, that I am a believing Jew. But I will never give up belief in you. I will never die faithless. I was born a believing Jew, and I shall die a believing Jew. There is no enemy you can hurl at me that will ever defeat my belief that the Jews will somehow re give rebirth to their existence, reconnect with their God, and reconstitute themselves as a nation. I refuse to die a non-believer. And then he said the eternal words, recited by every Jewish martyr throughout history. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. May He be with us today, may He be with us forever. May Israel know peace and security. May Israel know our dedication and our devotion. May we turn back Israel's enemies on its heels. May we fight for the justice of its cause. And more than anything else, my friends, May the Jewish people in general and the great majestic state of Israel in particular become the great light that it is to the nations and may we all revel and bask in that light. Thank you very much. Again, I want to thank you very much for joining us in Caulfield Shul. You are no doubt a passionate, inspirational uh, speaker about Israel, about all things Jewish, and we very much appreciate uh, you being here for the whole Shabbat uh, and for today. I think you challenge everybody on a personal level, on a, in, on a family level, and on a community level, and for that we thank you. Just have a small presentation to thank you. I'm fortunate to have just returned from a trip to Israel with my 16-year-old daughter, uh, who's still there at the moment. 
during which time I managed to spend some quality time with uh, my daughter Amy, with family in Beach Shemesh, and believe it or not, with government representatives. Thank you. With government representatives from the Prime Minister's office, um, the member of Knesset Manuel Trachtenberg's office, the Department of Health and the Department of Welfare, and a number of not-for-profit organisations, as well as leaders from Young, Young We Could. What struck me most about these various discussions was the keen interest in how Israel was being portrayed in Australia and how the Australian Jewish community was responding. I assured them at every opportunity that we are a very Zionistic community and that while we have a diverse range of views, we were steadfast in our defence of Israel. With thanks to the Australian Friends of Likud, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Sharon Haskell to speak to us today. For someone, for someone so young, please come up, Sharon. For someone so young, Sharon has experienced so much and is therefore no doubt highly qualified to be the youngest member of Likud in the 20th Knesset of Israel. While Sharon was born in Canada, she immigrated to Israel with her family when she was one year old and served in the IDF as a combat soldier. Since then, Sharon has studied in the United States, lived in Australia working as a veterinary nurse in Sydney, and completed her bachelor degree in political science and international relations. As a member of the 20th Knesset, Sharon is involved in many government committees, including foreign affairs and defence, science and technology, and drugs and alcohol. Sharon is also chair of the lobby for medical cannabis in Israel, which will no doubt be of great interest to our government representatives who are here today. Sharon, I want to thank you for making the time to join us today, and welcome. Thank you. Um, firstly, I would probably ask another round of applause to Rabbi Shmulek Botech for this beautiful speech. I was very touched by it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me today. Um, I had a speech, but in the, in the, in the recent words that uh, Rabbi Shmulek Botech was saying, I would like to speak about the reason why I'm traveling through Australia and through America for the past month as well. We are celebrating now our Independence Day, which is not just Independence Day of Israel, it is the Independence Day for Jews all around the world. It's the first time that we were able to have our own um, moral, educated society, our own defense, Jews, in our homeland, and so this is a celebration of the independence of all of us. And we were talking, we heard a little bit before about the wars that Israel was facing, the total wars against different countries that uh, are surrounding us. And we were outnumbered, and uh, we were fighting against much stronger, more equipped armies. Yet we defeated them. Time after time, we defeated them in these wars and after time after time they tried to destroy this little country this little isle of democracy this rev revolutionary idea of freedom of liberty in the middle east how dare they only after we defeated them a few times they gave up they understood that we'd be, with these wars and this violence and these tanks and airplanes and forces, they will not defeat Israel. They will not defeat the Jewish people. And so they turned out to another way. They brought terror into Israel. They thought that we, with terror, they'll defeat us. And I, I lived through this difficult time around the time of the Second Intifada. We're taking a, bu a bus to my high school would be like playing a game of a Russian roulette. One morning when I woke up late to school, I was having my breakfast, you could hear a loud explosion. I opened the TV and that was the bus that I was meant to take to my high school. Suicide bombers in restaurants, bars, murdering innocent people. They tried to eliminate our country, to kill our people. Yet with this terror, they did not defeat us. We did not surrender to that, and we kept our homeland. And so now Israel is facing a new war, a new existential threat, and it is fought on three different fields. One of them is our economy. 
if they can't take Israel by our force, if they can't kill the Jewish people that sit in Israel, let's destroy their economy. This young, stable, independent economy that we were actually be able, were able to create, advancing uh, humanity with renewable energy, water technology, medical research. And so if we eliminate this economy, they will destroy Israel. This is what all these anti-Israeli uh, boycott movements are trying to do. And then there's another front. This front is about our reputation, about this fact, this idea of this isle of democracy and freedom and liberty that Shmulek was, Rabbi Shmulek Botech was speaking about. Equal rights to everybody. Can you imagine that in the Middle East? And so they are, they are spreading lies about the country of Israel as if we are this apartheid country who have separate um, uh, medical... I mean, you, you guys, most of you know what is an apartheid country in South Africa. To think that Israel, where Arab and Jews, Druze, Muslims take part in every kind of our society, in our medical field, the head of the Nahriya Hospital, he's from an Arab minority, in a legal system where some of our high supreme judges are from an Arab minority. Can you imagine a high supreme judge in Iran? Jew sitting in, in, in the, as the head of a hospital in, in Syria, educators in all of these countries, parliamentarians. More than 10% of the Israeli parliaments are from Arab minorities. Can you imagine that in a Palestinian authority? Yet Israel is this apartheid state, is this racist country where minorities, the most persecuted minorities who are Christians in the Middle East, they find refuge in Israel. We accept minorities from the Baha'i in Iran to the Christian in southern Lebanon. And by spreading all these lies on campuses, in the media, in social media, you've seen that. They are trying to destroy our reputation of what Israel truly is. And without that, what is the meaning of Israel? How will our allies like Australia and the United States will stand beside us? And then they've opened a new front, another one as well, that's the third one, which is our history. If they cut down our roots, our history, our tradition, this book, the Bible that we've been following for thousands of years, if we don't know our roots, if we, if we don't have roots and we don't have any future, and what happened in UNESCO three weeks ago, that's the proof for that. The UN body that is meant to preserve all histories, archaeological site, is rewriting history, is telling us that the Wailing Wall and the Temple Mount has no relationship or connection to Judaism or to Jews, just to Muslims. This is rewriting our history. And so what kind of claim will we have later on on Israel? And this is a real battle right now that we are facing, a new fight that Israel is fighting on its existence, fought on, three, on these three fronts. But they didn't destroy us, they didn't eliminate us through those total wars. They didn't eliminate us with the Intifada, with terror, and they will not eliminate us with this new war that they've opened. But we need you on our side as well. How do we fight this? Our economy, we keep on sending the best technology, the best research all around the world. We promote business. Like in Australia, I know how strong the friendship is, how strong the partnership is, how our economy are exchanging, how investment in startups is, is exchanging between Israel and Australia. And this is how we fight that with America, which is also one of our biggest allies. This is how we fight this front. And with media, you all have this phone, this machine. This is our weapon, and you all are soldiers as well. Spread the truth about Israel with as much passion, as much as they fight us with their lies. And the third one about our history, 
is about spreading this word, putting pressure on governments, on these bodies like the United Nation, who's becoming a complete joke, a complete tool to poison minds and change history. We fight that with strong relationships with governments, with different governments from different countries, through you. And so I want to thank you all, first of all, for giving me the opportunity to speak in front of you today. Secondly, for being such true friends to Israel, to standing beside us, fighting alongside with us. And I call you all to take part in this new fight that we are facing today. Thank you very much. Wow. Sharet, with someone like you sitting in the Knesset, I think we all have great confidence in the future of Israel. We thank you for joining us today, and we have a small gift for you. Before I ask Adam Siegel to lead us in Brikhan Mazon, Grace After Meals, it is most appropriate that on a day where we're celebrating Yom Asmod, Israel's 68th birthday, we take the time to acknowledge Adam and his tireless work over the many years at Caulfield Shul. Recently, as many of you know, Adam has made the decision with his family to make Aliyah. And while there will be a formal Kiddish in Adam's honour later this year, I wanted to personally and on behalf of Caulfield Shul thank you, Adam, for your efforts and wish you and your family Bahatzlacha and all the best. But I, invite... I invite you now, Adam, to say your karmas on. Rabotai nevarech. And to the table captains, we thank you. An event such as this, as you know, does not run by itself. Jesse Bronstein, a member of the board, has once again surpassed our expectations, and he was extremely well supported by the staff of Caulfield Shul, including Rachel, Nadine, Yael, Sharon, and Simona. Please join me in congratulating and thanking them for a job well done. We also just have three announcements that I want to make before we finish off with Hatikva. Firstly, for those of you that would like to hear Shmuley again for the second, third, fourth, or fifth time this weekend, um, he'll be speaking tonight at Caulfield Shul at 8pm on a topic of same-sex relationships, how should the Jewish community respond. Copies of his book will also be available tonight at that forum. Secondly, Caulfield Shul has decided in context of its regeneration and reinvigoration and together with the building uh, community program to finally document our history over the last 70 years. And so I would ask if anyone has any historical information, photos, documentation, if they could please hand it to the office. We'll take care of it, look after it for you and return it to you once our history is written. And finally, just a plug for a comedy night on the 28th of June with local Jewish comedians, including Josh Gergel, Ellie Greenberg, Tal Ellenson, Aaron Goodhart, Michael Schaefer, Ellie Landis, Annette Bird and Benji Lovett. Please stand up and join me and join Mordechai Levin from our Hebra in the singing of Hatikva. <laughs> Oh, she may
Good morning.